Thank you very much. We'll now take the questions and comments. And I see there's one already. Professor. Rocco, you kept us awake because you used a very well-known algorithm. Julia Roberts, Claude Levi-Strauss, and Sigmund Freud, only in the casino, only in the casino do we have a uh, uh, discourse on this. Um, so there are very, very few human universals. Very few. Two are the exogamic principle, all society known through the ethnographic record classify those with whom sexual intimacy is allowed and those with whom it is prohibited. An entire architecture of an entire discipline it was built around trying to understand this phenomenon. And of course, uh, Levi-Strauss is the one in a cycle of, uh, of uh, scholarly study. And um, a French anthropologist, although Levi-Strauss is the least French of all the anthropologists because of his history and, and his training, have uh, devoted enormous amounts of time to try to understand this problem. The second principle that is universal is exophagy. You don't eat your own. It's a kind of an exo-cannibalism that is uh, widely marked. Now, the fascinating question that the couple, the problem of authority, which as you suggest, uh, Freud, but the Lacan more than Freud, elaborated, which is the idea that the father, the nom de père, the father, emerges as the law separating the child from the mother, uh, is uh, very, very interestingly problematized in the so-called matrilineal society. And here, the great Polish anthropologist, Bronislaw Malinowski, wrote the definite study. Because in the Trobian Islands, the law is the mother's brother. It's a matriline. The law is not the father. The father is a guest. It's a guest worker in the, in the Trobian system. So the question there becomes, what is the nature of the relationship between the sexual access that the father has and the mother, the intimacy, with the problem of the law, the problem of the beginning of culture? The beginning of culture is the beginning of prohibition. So I wonder if you could reflect upon the, the scholarship where the matter of intimacy in love is separated from how the family becomes constituted as a legal and symbolic order. In, instead of your responding right away, I think we should take a few questions. And everyone, try to, try to keep your, your questions or comments short, because we already have at least four people down on the list. Uh, so, uh, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Yes, you, you managed not to make everybody sleep. That is a major. Now, in 1944, Karl Polanyi published his fundamental book, The Great Transformation. And in that book, he says, as a consequence of the first and second industrial revolution, two movements were emerged. One is the movement of liberty, the other one of social justice. The first movement puts liberty on the top, and that generates all liberal in political terms uh, uh, thinking. The other one, social democracy, social democracy, or lib lab as Paulo prefers to call it. Now, in the 80s, Nancy Fraser, the American philosopher, she said, that is correct, but the novelty of this historical period historical period means after globalization and after the third industrial revolution, is the emergence of a third movement, which she calls uh, emancipatory movement. Now, what is the characteristic of this movement? That uh, these people do not ask more liberty or more, let's say, resources for welfare program, etc. But they ask recognition, what uh, Plato called the timos, 
the most in Greek is recognition. And so she says, today we have to face a political, or better to say, a cultural trilemma. Because people continue to think in terms of right and left, which has, a, has no sense because it's not complete. We have to consider the third, the massive. And who are these? The feminist movements, the LGTG, whatever movement. The, the... Now, in terms of what you said, what is your opinion on that? Because they said, this third movement wants a recognition of a new type of family, which is not based on the previous family. How would you react in a synthetic way to this uh, argument, which is getting ground and ground, more ground, you know, even in a country like we're, we're, I hope you're noting down the points. I think we're going to, Paolo? Thank you. My question will be very brief. Um, so, um, uh, Rocco, you, you know, you propose this retrenchment, um, and in the retrenchment, you propose, you repropose some of the basic principles that ought to be, that we ought to use to accompany young people towards this new ethic or new awareness of an ethic. But much of the language that you're using as the vehicle for reproposing it, at least in this paper, is still the language of traditional natural law, which we, we all know from experience has lost its resonance, it, it, it merely as a practical matter, if nothing else, culturally, right? So I, I, I'd, I'd be interested in your reflections on what would be the vehicle, conceptually and rhetorically, uh, that you would propose as, as the means for entering into this dialogue with new generations, given sort of, you know, what, what Benedict the Sixteenth called the bluntness that natural law discourse has, has attained in our culture. Thanks for keeping that to the point. And now we have Marcelo. We have two more. Marcelo and then colleagues. colleagues. To, the, to the same question. So the real question is, for me, as say Pope Francis, the new colonial, ideological colonialism don't believe not only in God, but not believe in the natural, in the creation of God, in the natural law, that in the end is creation of God. So, and propose a sort of trans transhumanism that, that could be not sex. The sex not have really importance. So this is, for this reason I say in, in Pier Paolo, that we need to find a definition, relation between the, hum, the human being, but the human being concretely, the man and woman. That is a classic definition. So to the new generation, we need to propose this <laughs> in, a, in a very nice way, but this is the question. Marcelo. In the same way of Marcelo. We should consider another sort of revolution. It's not merely the sexual revolution that we are facing currently. We are facing the biotechnological revolution that splits life from sex through cells manipulation. So it's a different kind of revolution that uh, consists of the commodification of human beings and families, the fabrications and the industrialization of babies that con uh, uh, are facing us with different models of family, different mo uh, family models. is a big concern because it has to do with the MRC, the MRC that the Bob is, is asking us in, in many encyclicals, but also is expanding the concept of relational good. It's not a relational good merely that has to do with female and males. We have many different family models that we have to consider. As you mentioned in the last part of your paper, in a new pastoral way. We have been talking about this with the cardinal uh, in, the, in the break this morning. If we don't consider the different family models, we are uh, losing a big part of, of our reality. Uh, thank you. Now, we only have time for a very short reply. You're not going to be able to respond to everything that was said. We'll have to take that at the coffee break, but if you just want to come with a two minutes, Mac. It's hard. 
I will start with uh, Professor Putnam. Um, he said something extremely important. Uh, he said, um, it is not so important what you think. It is important that you come with us and enter and participate in our life. I think that uh, the answer to Paolo is exactly this. We live in a society in which a lot of people have the most extravagant uh, models of family. It does not matter. Uh, the church has a proposal. It is, first of all, the proposal of a uh, living together, of a living community. The church is not a doctrine. The church is a living community of faith. Come and see. And in the beginning, uh, you will have uh, attitudes that do not correspond to the doctrine. Well, it does not matter. Uh, you will change participating in the life, remembering one fundamental principle that has been reproposed by Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia, but it was formulated in the grand tradition of the church. I wish to quote here Alfonso Lopez Trujillo, a reactionary as very few in the history of the church. Those of you who know him, well, he has written a wonderful handbook for confessors in which he says, uh, the confessor should never um, uh, tell to somebody who does not understand that what he's doing is wrong, that he is wrong. Never tell him until he has uh, uh, created the presuppositions, the cognitive presuppositions that allow him to understand that he is wrong, but also the affective presuppositions that allow him to accept and to see in the objective norm, the subjective norm of his own life, of his own happiness. So I think the real problem is pastoral, a pastoral that does not exclude anybody, that allows everybody to come, and that takes uh, the, uh, the responsibility of accompanying everybody through the differentiated uh, processes or to the differentiated paths that correspond to the situation of everybody. It is not a problem of changing a doctrine. It is a problem of making a pastoral revolution. First comes the person. And, uh, and the life of the person is very long. In the life of the person, there is a lot of time to learn things that in the beginning I do not accept. Once priests were convinced that they were the authority, they said what is true, and everybody should obey. Now, they must be able to produce the evidence that what they say is true, and they cannot pretend to do it all at, all at once. They go, must go step by step. If I have one minute, have I? No. I stop here. <laughs> <laughs>